This summer was really hard on corals. Bleaching was happening all over the world with ocean temperatures reaching over 100 degrees Fahrenheit in Florida waters. But one researcher is trying to help those corals out as much as possible. And the solution? Crabs. We're going to talk about that on today's episode of the How to Protect the Ocean podcast. Let's start the show. Hey everybody, welcome back to another exciting episode of the How to Protect the Ocean podcast. I am your host, Andrew Lewin, and this is the podcast where you find out what's happening with the ocean, how you can speak up for the ocean, and what you can do to live for a better ocean by taking action. And this is another podcast that is a little bit different from the normal ones. I am still at my parents' house recording uh, because I'm staying with my parents to help them out. My mom that got COVID this year or this week, and so she is isolating in the basement, and my dad is immunocompromised, so we're trying to keep him uh, healthy as possible, and I am looking after him while I'm here. So I am recording late at night on a Thursday before I publish this episode uh, to ensure that we can still get the episodes out. And I found a great article because you know Fridays is all about how to help the ocean by taking action. And action is being taken by a researcher in Florida to help the reefs of the Florida Keys and maybe other reefs down the road. Um, There's research that suggests that crabs could help corals Uh, by taking away, by eating the algae that is covering them to help them grow. So pretty cool thing that is going on. Dr. Jason uh, Spadero, his lab um, out of the Florida Keys, he is a researcher at Moat Marine Laboratory and Aquarium. He's heading up an an ambitious plan to breed a quarter of a million Caribbean king crabs each year. And it's not about seafood, it's about these crabs that are indeed delicious, but also help coral reefs survive by eating algae. Now, why is that important that they need to eat algae? Well, let's just talk about the biology of a coral for a minute here. Corals are photosynthetic animals, right? They are also symbiotic animals. They require algae, this little algae called zooanthellae, to live within their skeleton. The zooanthellae are plants. And so essentially they are are, uh, algae, right? Phytoplankton. And so they will actually, yeah, phytoplankton. So they will eat sunlight they will they will absorb sunlight and and they will photosynthesize and so their um, their byproducts are calcium and so the calcium is taken up by the uh, by the corals and the corals build their skeleton with a limestone base and that's how they grow and that's how coral reefs grow each coral will continue to grow some faster than others but hard corals that use a calcium base will grow and grow and grow and that essentially forms a coral reef having those zooanthellae is critical to their growth and their survival and so with that the algae the zooanthellae has to stay in the coral skeleton if it leaves the coral skeleton it loses the color and it also could at a, for a prolonged time, if it loses the zooanthellae for a prolonged time, it could eventually die. And when the zooanthellae is expelled from the corals, then that's when we look at it as bleached because it's white. So we call it bleached. So high sea surface temperatures, the sea surface is where a lot of these corals are. They are normally in very shallow waters, although there are some deep sea corals. But these corals that provide essential habitat for fish, Uh, provide security for shorelines, provide food for fishers, um, require these corals to grow. And if the corals don't grow, then they die. And if the sea surface temperature is hot, then they die eventually because of prolonged bleaching. And so we need to protect the coral reefs. They are critical habitats. They are essential habitats for our survival in many, many ways. There are not only just in the Florida Keys, but also uh, everywhere around the world where they're found. But because climate change is such a crazy thing, and because it's increasing daily, we need to find ways to help these corals now. There's not a lot 
we can do on an individual basis to help corals from climate change. That seems to be just doing things on its own. However, researchers suggest or research, research suggests that we could do stuff, we could help corals by taking away all of the other things that we do to harm corals. That includes, um, you know, water, bad water quality that goes over corals, so high nutrient waters that go over corals, um, coastal development that allows sedimentation to go onto corals because it smothers the corals and they can't get the sunlight to the zooanthellae, um, algae growth because of high sea surface temperatures and the right amount of nutrients can happen. Um, so we have to do things in a large way to get better water quality, ensure that the water quality is great, um, decrease overfishing, to get rid of overfishing, protect these areas as much as possible, and then also try to control the algae by putting in better water quality, but also by getting rid of the algae that grows because of sea, high sea surface temperatures. You know, that is a difficult thing to do. In comes the crabs. In comes specifically uh, the king crab, the Caribbean king crabs. And Jason Spadaros did some research where he looked at the amount of algae that a that these Caribbean king crabs uh, eat in their diets and how it could help um, coral reefs and could it help coral reefs. So he did a study where they put out crabs um, uh, within one square meter and and that's how much the density was in one in one area and after a year the crab filled reefs so the reefs that had crabs in them had uh, about 85 percent less algae compared to the reefs he left alone so a follow-up experiments found similar results so we know based on research in a 2021 study that these crabs will eat a lot of algae and that the algae will come off the corals and that there'll be more coral cover than not. Now, when algae overgrows the corals, they can't get sunlight and eventually die, okay? When algae grows on the rocks that the corals are there, some algae will actually put out sort of like a, a pheromone or some sort of chemical that impede corals from landing there or surviving to land or being able to stick there. So I, I don't have the research around that, probably need to do an episode around that but that that's what happens sometimes so we're looking to decrease the amount of algae that are on the rocks now normally that was naturally done back in the in the past parrot fish and other herbivores fish were able to keep the algae down low other invertebrates as well would be able to keep the algae down low urchins are are voracious uh, algae eaters as well as a different amount of crabs as well as parrot fish and other herbivores fish however herbivores fish were overfished and so we saw a decrease in the amount of herbivores, herbivores fish. We also saw a decrease in the urchins because of disease. And so all of that coming together, you're not getting the same amount of animals and the same different types of animals that are eating algae and because they're being affected in different ways and largely disappearing from reefs in, in the numbers that are needed. It, it lacks the number that, that is needed to keep the algae off the reefs. So in comes Spadero's research and in comes his, you know, his, his mission to continue to populate these uh, Florida Key reefs with the Caribbean king crabs. And so he's got a spot, you know, in Sarasota, Florida, as well as just down by the Keys, where he is growing and breeding uh, these crabs. So he's, he's got a, a roughly a hundred crabs in the Florida Keys and 200 at a new breeding facility in Sarasota. So he'll start dropping them into the ocean as soon, uh, as the end of the year or early in 2024. So maybe at the end of this year, 2023 or 2024, which will help, right? There's, there's, that's got to help the crabs, uh, that's going to help the algae cover and decrease the algae cover. But there's one little problem. These crabs are being raised in tanks by themselves where there are no predators for these crabs. Now, the good thing is, I should mention, that these Caribbean king crabs are native to Florida waters, Floridian waters. So that's a good thing. You're not putting in invasive species. You're not introducing another species that could take over. This is a crab that belongs there. It's a crab that needs to be repopulated. So essentially, you're just stocking the area to help with a specific um, need to decrease algae. 
So that's always good. The problem is, as I mentioned, they are growing on their own without predators available, predators that will eat them. So they need to almost be scared to death or scared so they don't die, let's be honest. And it's around Halloween. So, you know, what do you do around Halloween? You dress up in costumes. And I'm not saying that researchers are dressing up in costumes to scare these crabs that are in tanks that are in the breeding facilities, but they're doing something very similar. They engaged with elementary, local elementary schools to create puppets of different predators that would help them uh, kind of be scared of these predators. So things that look like octopuses, snappers, and groupers were being made and are hand puppets that these researchers put in to ensure that these crabs are scared of these animals. Now, good. the good news is these crabs do not have good eyesight because these puppets are that they're puppets with like googly eyes and everything like that um, so they're not very realistic however the eyesight of crabs aren't that great so it does provide them with a little bit of um, of fear so that they won't get eaten or that they will know to hide when these predators come around so if you go to the link in the show notes you will see a picture of the you'll see a link to the article and you'll see a picture closer to the bottom of the page and you can see one of the puppets that look like an octopus um, and you'll see that it's very not very realistic. However, it has the tentacles, it has the body, and it has the eyes, so it does look somewhat like uh, an octopus. So we'll see how these things do, how these crabs do, and how this work uh, does in terms of scaring them. But there's going to be a constant stalking of crabs until there's an established population, I assume, or there's going to continue to keep stalking these. Um, there's a lot of cool ways that you can help the ocean, and this is one of them. And I really respect the, the effort and the work that's done by Moat Marine Laboratory and Dr. Spadaro's uh, sorry, uh, work uh, and his efforts to help these coral reefs because something's got to be done. And the way to do it, especially with climate change rearing its ugly head like it did this summer and bleached a lot of corals, we need to ensure that these corals are as healthy as possible so that when climate change um events happen like it did this summer we're putting them in the best we're putting these corals in the best positions to be resilient and survive these sort of natural quote-unquote natural disasters so this is what's being done this is what's part of that that is being done um so i highly recommend that you go to the moat marine laboratory website look more into this look at how you can fund these types of things i think it would be really interesting and i think it's something um that is just innovative and cool and it's going to be necessary taking uh, a species that is supposed to be in the Caribbean, repopulating it to help with algae. I wonder if other species can have it. And just as a side note, as the entrepreneur in me really looks at it, this would be great to fund. You know, you have you if you if you are able to do this on a commercial level, you know, as a as a business, you could probably raise a lot of these king crabs as seafood, and then take a portion of those and stock the ocean. You know, this is a great like sort of B Corp type social um, entrepreneurship type of work, a social, social enterprise where you can help the ocean and also feed people in an aquaculture facility that's not affecting the ocean, right? That are separated in tanks and raised um, and, you know, given for seafood. Anyway, that's just the entrepreneur in me. I would love to hear your thoughts about this. Um, you can get a hold of me by DMing me on Instagram at How to Protect the Ocean. You can also um, go to speakupforblue.com and you can go to speakupforblue.com forward slash contact and that will bring you to the form. Fill out that form, it goes right to my email. And then uh, if you want to uh, leave me a voicemail so I can hear your lovely voices, uh, you can do so by going to speakupforblue.com in the bottom right page, click on the microphone, leave me a voicemail. I would love to hear your voices. Um, but that's it for today's episode. Uh, if you know someone who would like to hear more about what's being done in the ocean, you can share this with them. It's free. All you have to do is copy the link in the podcast app that you're in and just text them or share it, WhatsApp them, whatever you'd like to do. Um, I would be very appreciative of that. And I'm sure your friends would too, or family members would too. So uh, that's it for today's episode. I would like to thank you so much for listening to this episode of the How to Protect the Ocean podcast. Have a great day. We'll talk to you next time and happy conservation. <laughs>